This is going to be an overview of the book Hosea. Hosea is a minor prophet in the Bible. And he is the last prophet to minister to Israel before they fell to Assyria. He prophesied while Uzziah was reigning in Judah. And the Lord has Hosea to do a very interesting object lesson. He gives him a very unusual command. You see, since Israel has committed spiritual adultery, he has Hosea to take a wife of whoredoms to show Israel an illustration of what they have done, spiritually speaking. In Hosea 3.1, it says, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, get an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, and look to other gods. Notice that. He's t he told him to take a woman that's an harlot, it says in Hosea 14, 1, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. He wants Hosea to take a wife of whoredoms because Israel has fallen by their iniquity. They went after other gods and they've committed spiritual adultery. And if you look at it prophetically, then you will see Israel's repentance at the second coming. Because in Hosea 14, 1, he says, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God. And that's what Israel's going to do one day. But this book has 14 chapters, <clears throat> has 197 verses, and it has 5,175 words, or around 5,175 words. Hosea's name means God is salvation. And in chapter 1, you see Hosea's wife and children. You see the spiritual condition of Israel, which is obviously bad. In Hosea 1, 2, it says, The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So Hosea does what the Lord says. And imagine if the Lord told you to go find the biggest hoe in your town and marry her. Imagine how that might feel. It says in Hosea 1.3, So he went and took Gomer. And to top it off, this whore's name was Gomer. Imagine having to marry a woman who wasn't a recovering harlot, but presently still a whore. And there are women who were whores in the past, but got right with the Lord, and they made good wives. But this was a wife of whoredoms. Imagine if you had to marry a woman that every man in town had been with. Now, the Lord's not going to tell you to do that today. If he did, it would go against 2 Corinthians 6.14 that says not to be unequally yoked together. But 2 Corinthians 6.14 is a direct command to you today. And this proves... Rightly dividing in your Bible study is essential. Sometimes God had these prophets do some things that he's not going to tell you to do. Uh, you can't go to Hosea 1-2 and apply that to you as a direct command. Never did, did the Lord want pe uh, the saints to marry someone that wasn't right with him. But this was a special case where he, he like, he told Isaiah to go go naked. You know, it's 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 a special case where he has these prophets do something for shock value to get a hold of the Jews because the Jews require a sign. You don't want to go to Hosea and apply that to yourself and go marry a harlot or something like that. You have to use common sense. You have to figure out, is God talking to you or is he just talking to this person in the Bible? But not only did he have to marry a whore, he had to have kids with her. And the kids have very significant names. In verse 4, one of their names is Jezreel. This means scattered by God. Another one of their names is Leruama. This means not pitied. Both of these things happen to the Jews. Scattered, not pitied. Imagine having to marry a woman like this. And then her possibly end up divorcing you. 
take all your paycheck and child support, and then not even let you see the kids. But Hosea had faith in God. He did what God said. And at the beginning of chapter 2, you're going to see Israel punished for their sins. But at the end of chapter 2, he talks about their restoration. It says in Hosea 2, 2, Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her side and her adulteries from between her breasts. So God puts away Israel because of her whoredoms. They committed spiritual adultery. They went after other gods who couldn't see, they couldn't hear or walk. Gods who they would have to hold up from falling even. Hosea 2, 7 and 8 says, And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. She shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband. For then was it better with me than now. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. This works in more than one way. Most times when a person is divorced, they're spiritual. When they divorce their spouse, they find out their new husband or wife has a whole other set of problems that their first wife didn't have. They find out they were better off with their first husband or wife, and they want to go back to them. And then looking at it another way, Hosea's wife was better off with Hosea. And another way is when you leave God and go after other gods, you find out you were way better off with God. Many people think they would have a lot more fun living for the world. And then they get out there in the world and find out that the way of transgressors is hard. And they find out that it was so much better when they were in fellowship with God. But in chapter 2, you see the Lord's mercy on Israel. In Hosea two sixteen through 18, it says, And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that the, thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Bailey. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. That's referring to the future millennial kingdom. Israel's going to be restored. Hosea 2.23, And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. That's what Israel will do in the millennium. And in chapter 3, Hosea redeems his wife. Hosea 3.2, it says, So I brought her to me for fifteen pieces of silver, and for an homer of barley, and an half homer of barley. Illustrations that Hosea has a whore for a wife, just like God did with Israel. But even though they are whores, they are restored back. Even though Israel is blind today, they will also be restored. Romans eleven twenty five says, And so all Israel shall be saved. Hosea three five Afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. So God is not through with Israel. He's not cast them off forever. In chapter 4, the Lord accuses Israel and Ephraim is banished for idolatry. Hosea 4.1 Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth nor mercy nor knowledge of God in the land. They aren't hearing the word of the Lord. And that is where you find truth. That's where you find mercy and the knowledge of God. The more you learn about God, the more you grow as a saint. But there was no knowledge of God in the land. Second Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. There is no knowledge of God in the average person today. You meet people who don't even know that Jesus Christ is God. You meet people who think God is okay with everything and everyone. The average person couldn't tell you if Hosea was in the Old or New Testament. They don't even know who Hosea is. There's no knowledge of God in the land. Hosea 4, 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. 
So people are destroyed for their lack of knowledge. You could have so much wisdom if you read the words of God that will lead you away from stupid, foolish things that you do. But people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Verse 13, Hosea 4 says, They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and elms because the shadow thereof is good. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom and your spouses shall commit adultery. Notice that they sacrifice under oaks and poplars and elms because the shadow thereof is good. This could be because they live for the flesh and the flesh loves a shady area. It could be also because because men like to do things in the dark and not out in the light. But it says, Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom, and your spouses shall commit adultery. Today men are sacrificing in the dark living room on a couch, putting things on a screen that are wicked, that put things in the mind of their family, their young daughters, their spouses, that could push them a certain way, to possibly commit a certain sin. I believe that there are movies. I believe that there's music and things like that. That push people to commit adultery. I personally believe that. And John 3.19 says. And this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. Men love that shady area. That they can hide and do something. But Hosea 4.14 says, I will punish your daughters when they commit whoredom. No, it says, I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery. For themselves are separated with whores, and they sacrifice with harlots. Therefore the people doth not understand shall fall. The people that doth not understand shall fall. Notice he said, I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom. Somebody might say, well, that's great. I can just do what I want with no consequence, but they're wrong. Punishment is better than no punishment. If God doesn't punish you, then that's a step above being punished. Not getting punishment is a punishment itself. Because if you don't get punished, you just keep right on doing what you're doing with no resistance, and you just continuously get worse. And if God punishes you, then maybe you'll hit rock bottom and do better. It's like a drug addict. If their parents keep giving them money, giving them food and vehicles and pampering their flesh, then they never hit rock bottom. Their sins, in a sense, don't get checked like they would if their parents don't support them. So they continue being pill heads for the rest of their life. And this guy said the other day that he won't ever help or give money or food to drug addicts because he said the only way him and his friends got off drugs is because people stopped helping them. Then he finally hit bottom and got off the drugs. If God quits punishing you, you're in trouble. You'll keep going right along doing what you're doing without getting checked for it. And you will go further and further down the path of destruction. In chapter 5, it talks about the punishment coming for Israel and Judah. He talks about how he will come at Ephraim like a young lion. In Hosea 5.15, it says, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face and their affliction they will seek me early. Don't be like them. Don't wait till last minute to seek his face. Don't wait till you're in affliction. Seek him now while everything's going good. Then when things go bad, you've already been in fellowship with him. In chapter 8, you see that you reap what you sow. Hosea 8, 7 says, For they have sown in the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. And the Bible says that in the New Testament. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. It says in Psalms, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. And Hosea 8, 14 says, For Israel hath forgotten his Maker, and buildeth temples. And Judah hath multiplied fenced cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. They forgot God. In chapter 9, you see the prophecy of Israel's coming punishment when they were put into captivity by Assyria. It says in Hosea 9.3, They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. 
It says in verse 7, the days of visitation are come. The days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad for the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred. You see that to the world, the prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad. To this world, if you're living right and you're trying to live for God, you're going to look foolish to the world. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. They said Jesus was beside himself. They said to Paul, much learning doth make thee mad. Paul said, I'm a fool for Christ's sake. See, to the world, that's how you look. In chapter 10, you see the fruitlessness of Israel. In Hosea 10, 8, talks about their high places. And they're going to say, they say, uh, it says, and they shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. That's a prophecy of what's to come in the tribulation. And it says, the thorn and the thistle shall come up upon their altars. Those altars they have, weeds and thorns and thistles, are going to be around it so high you couldn't even pay a man to weed eat it. It's going to be so bad. But this verse looks forward to the tribulation, when men are going to hide in the dens and rocks of the mountains from Jesus Christ coming on a white horse. And then in chapter 11, you see the Lord's love for Israel. It says in Hosea 11, 1 and 2, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. Imagine your hus wife or husband stepping out on you with another person. That is how the Lord felt concerning what Israel did to him. But in verse 10 it says, They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. See, the Lord's coming back as a lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's coming back and restoring Israel, who he loves, even though they went into spiritual adultery so many times. Chapter 12, the Lord has a controversy with Judah. The Lord is going to give it back to them as hard as they dished it out. It says in verse 2, The Lord hath also a controversy with Judah, and will punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his doings, will he recompense him. In the lake of fire, you will burn according to how wicked you were here. And Jesus talks about a greater damnation that some will receive. You're going to get it as good as you give it out. The worse you live and the more evil you are, the more you'll be punished in hell if you're lost. God is fair. He gives you according to your doings. For a safe man, you will pay for your sins in this life and not in hell, but you're going to get it back. Chapter 13, you see the judgment from God on Israel. And he says in Hosea 13, 1, When Ephraim spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel, but when he offended in Baal, he died. As Jesus said in Matthew 23, 12, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So they were living for self, going after false gods. Baal, for instance. And when Ephraim did that, he died. Hosea 13, 2, And now they sin more and more, and have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their understanding, all of it the work of the craftsmen, they say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Notice craftsmen made these images. They could have used their craft for good, yet the devil recruited them and they are using it for evil. What are you doing with your God-given abilities? Are you using it for the devil? Or are you using it for the Lord? Are you singing for the Lord? Are you drawing for the Lord? Painting? Whatever it may be for the Lord. It says in Hosea 13.3, Therefore they shall be as the morning cloud, and as the early dew that passeth away, as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor, and as the smoke out of the chimney. When you think about it, that's all of us. Your life is a vapor, James says. In Job, it describes it as wind. It's here for only a little time compared to eternity. Then you're gone and forgotten. What are you doing with your time on this earth? In chapter 14, Israel has a call for repentance. They say they will no longer take the works of their hands, and call it their gods. Hosea 14, 1, O Israel, return to the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. When you were lost, you had fallen, and you couldn't get up on your own. It was going to take the Lord. Mephibosheth was lame through a fall. Adam and Eve fell in the garden. Sin puts you on the ground, but Jesus Christ pulls you up and raises you up to sit in heavenly places with him. 
Hosea 14, 9, Who is wise, and he shall understand these things. Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. If you believe the Bible, then you know that everything in it is right. Even if your flesh thinks it's wrong, the just shall walk in the ways of the Lord, even if the flesh doesn't like it. But transgressors are going to fall. They stray from the way of the Lord because at the time it seems easier, but the way of transgressors is harder in the long run, and they're going to fall. But this has been a quick overview of the book of Hosea.